Good afternoon, and thank you for joining today's Tips and Tricks webinar, Top 10 Common Support Issues and How to Fix Them in Dynamics GP. I'm Megan Turco, and I'll be your moderator today. Before we jump in, I'm going to briefly go over how to use your webinar console. The orange arrow on the right side of your screen will let you toggle the control tray open or closed, and at the bottom of the control tray, you'll see a chat window. Please feel free to submit your questions at any time throughout the chat or throughout the webinar via the chat function. We will get to them either at the end of the webinar or definitely follow up afterwards if needed. Additionally, on your GoToWebinar console, you should see an area for audio settings. If you're calling in through your telephone, please choose the Use Telephone option. And alternatively, if you're using your computer speakers, please select the Use Mic and Speakers option. Additionally, I would like to note that today's webinar is being recorded. We'll send out the slides as well as a link to the on-demand recording of the webinar within about 48 hours. So definitely keep an eye out for that email if you are interested in accessing the webinar after today or sharing it with any colleagues who couldn't make, us, make it live today. And with that, I'd like to introduce today's featured webinar speakers. First up, David Maharg, who leads Armonino's installation, upgrade, and support teams. He has tremendous experience defining best practices, designing GP and other information systems, and leading the implementation of those solutions. We also have Tiffany Allison with us today. Tiffany leads Armanino's GP Support Help Desk, providing assistance in resolving common and also some not so common support issues every day. She has extensive experience with implementation, training, upgrades, and product support for GP. It's great to have you both with us here today. And with that, I'm going to pass the presentation over to David to get us started. Thanks, Megan. This is going to be a great webinar. I'm, I'm loving seeing the list of folks who are on our attendee list see a lot of familiar names, and so welcome and good day. So today we're going to take a look at um, the checklist of different things that we're going to do. The presentation is going to include a variety of different things. We, we've had to limit it to top 10 sort of, sort of thing. Unfortunately, there are other elements that might be covered in a normal support call that are, are frequent types of things. But we do want to touch upon a few. So these are the first four that I'll be covering. And then Tiffany will be doing the next set. So the uh, I, we just wanted to share this list with you so that you can get a sense of what it is we're going to be covering today. And if uh, hopefully at least one of these has been ha be of specific interest to you, because I think all of us would, are, would love to know how to do some of these things. Because if it happens to us, it's nice to be able to do it on our own and not necessarily have to call into the help desk, though we are available. So with that, let's talk about, you know, how did we, how did we pick upon these top 10? Well, these are kind of the most common ones we see. So we want to make sure that we talk that. Another element was that they don't involve SQL. SQL can be a complex type of thing. It can scare a lot of uh, uh, finance folks, for example. And so we just don't want to go there for this. However, Armanino can certainly help you at the SQL level if you need it, or your IT group. I also want to mention that some of the things that are not covered would be some of the elements that would be involved in our GP system admin training. This isn't a course that we teach, and so we have a very we have a formalized approach to it. It takes about six to seven hours to go through, and it's really designed for the IT group who is supporting your GP as well as those power users that really want to get in and discover exactly what's going on. So let's jump right in. All right. Can we see our screen yet? Looks like we're just getting our demo up here. There we go, everyone. Oops, what are we seeing? Is that your other oh, screen, uh, Tiffany? Pardon us here, folks. We'll get you on the right screen in just a moment. Tiffany? Uh, Tiffany, are you on mute? Did we lose you there for a second? That looks There like. we go. All right. So one of the things that we want to uh, jump into first is about fixed assets. A lot of times we're in a situation where we need to add value to a fixed asset, something that has changed value over time, and so we're going to jump into that. The value of an asset is determined at the asset book card. 
So I'm, I've clicked on a book card, and now I'm going to call up a particular asset. So we're going to do a look up here. We're going to find Mio. Let's choose this fancy automobile. That looks pretty fancy. And we're going to pick the book that is an, a, a tied to the GL. So that's the internal book. So this particular asset has already had value added. You know that based upon the beginning year cost. The be beginning year cost is what the original value of the asset was. And then we have cost basis noted just below. Notice it. It's $3,000 more than the original cost basis because I think we added a big fancy muffler set to it. But what I'm going to do here is I, we just added some more bumpers to it or something like that, which is another $4,000. So now we're at $72,000 worth of cost. So I've just added that. However, if you're ever changing the asset cost basis, I highly recommend that you select down here below, which would be normally default to straight line original life, to always change it to be straight line remaining life. This is critical because GP calculates the original uh, run rates of your assets based upon what you have as your, as your depreciation method. So when you change an asset cost, that's very easily done as you can see, I just added it to the cost basis. However, always change this to straight line remaining life. That will force GP to recalculate your depreciation at the proper rates right off the bat. So we're going to do that, and then we're going to press Save. Now it's going to warn us, hey, you've done something different to the, to the fixed asset uh, depreciation sensitivity fields. Are you sure you want to continue? We'll say yes. And then we're presented with a, an important selection. We have to choose whether we want this depreciation change to change for the life of the asset, for this fiscal year only, or for recalculating from this day forward. And let's talk about that, Rolf, just very briefly. You would typically not choose life, particularly if an asset has already uh, traversed a couple of one or more years of life. And the reason for that, if you press life, it's going to recalculate the depreciation from the beginning of time for this asset all the way through now. That means you're going to be changing depreciation rates and expenses for the life of the asset, meaning that you would have changed uh, past history. So we don't want to typically do that. You could select year if you are prepared to deal with the changes for this fiscal year and just make it run for this year. Or the more common way in this particular instance is to press recalculate, and that will recalculate the depreciation as of today going forward. So that's all there is to it. There is one other small area I just want to introduce you to. When, just by changing the cost basis does not change the asset acquisition cost. So we might, and, and I encourage you to do this, is to go in here and add an additional line. We'll do, um, what do we take that to? Uh, $7,000 in this case to get it up to seventy two. So I just added a line of $7,000, and I press OK. Now this is going to show me $72,000. This doesn't have any impact on depreciation. It's just a record in the database that says this acquisition cost is now $72,000. So uh, this card and the book card are different cards, and so they are not necessarily interrelated. All right, let's take a look at running check links and, and reconciles. Those tend to be pretty important little elements that are done when you are trying to fix a data point or there's something wrong with your database. Those are handled at the various levels in the utilities window. So if I go to the utilities, I can see a reconcile routine here for the financial module. In this case, I, could, I can do a reconcile for the year, allocation accounts, or batches. And what this does is it updates, it looks at the detail and then updates the summary tables or the header records, if you will. So uh, a reconcile is not actually going to point out, you know, this doesn't tie to this anymore, whatever. It's really just going to go in and, and calculate out the detail lines and then update the summary tables. So uh, that's what a reconcile does for you. Checklinks, on the other hand, is a database cleansing utility. It's used very sparingly because you don't necessarily want to, to use it unless you really need to. There's one time during the year that we advise you to do it, and that is at the year and close process. So I'm going to click on maintenance and check links. This is where, how you get to it. 
If I were at the year in close process, I would actually go through, select all logical tables and push them over to the right hand window. That's for the financial module. Then I go to sales and I push them all over for the sales module. And I keep going down this list for each module, pushing all tables over to the right. Then I would run check links for the after the year and close process. This could take many hours, so I want you to be careful with it. It might be nice to do it in a test uh, company first so that you know exactly how long it's going to take uh, because it could take many hours. And with check links, we always advise you to do a backup of your database prior to running it. Check links will actually change your data and to, to make it accurate. Check links is, is really designed to help you to make sure that your detail matches your header records. So if it finds a detail record and no header record, it's going to delete those detail lines. And so you might end up like with an inventory number change or something uh, because it's trying to help correct it. And so you need to be prepared. If you don't like what Check Links is going to do, then you uh, can revert in, via the backup. Typically, though, Check Links is doing what it's supposed to do and fixing the links between different records. So uh, use it sparingly and use it wisely. Always have a backup prior to doing a Check Links, even if it's just for one table. Uh, that would be the way to do it. There's one question we get a lot, which is, who's logged into my GP? And that tends to, it's very easy, because you want to see who's logged in. That is under the Administration tab. And we're painting the screen here. There we go. And it's right here. Under System, under Utilities, we have User Activity. So if I click on User Activity, it actually will show me everybody who's currently logged in to GP. In this case, we have three people logged in. And guess what? We have this test user who logged into Fabricam back in May, and they're still in there. So this would be, we could easily just get rid of them uh, because we can presume that they haven't been actively working in the company since uh, May, and we could just delete them. And that will remove their login from the system then when they come in next, they're going to have to re-log in. So this is a very easy way to see who's currently logged into GP without having to go to a SQL table or, or a SQL view. The next one is kind of an interesting one. It's unknown dictionary error. Let me demonstrate what one, one type of experience of that is. I'm going to go to the purchasing module, and I'm going to click on a window, which happens to be the vendor card. And we get a message. It's an error. I can't access this form because the dictionary containing it is not loaded. Well, that's frustrating. Uh, and so you're going, what the heck is going on? Well, I wanted to show you where you're going to go to find out what's going on. We're going to go to administration again. And where that is held is in the modified forms and reports ID. So we're going to go here, and we're going to go to setup. Here it is and it's Alternate Modified Forms and Reports. We'll click on that, and it opens up a, a window. We're going to go ahead and pick out the Modified Forms and Report ID. Most systems will have just one. Occasionally, we'll have one with two or three, um, and it, it's, there must be a specific reason for that, but most systems will have one of these, and everybody will be set to use it. So I'm going to select the one, and I'm going to select Windows in this case, because what we're experiencing is a dictionary window thing. So we're going to select Windows. It's going to repaint the screen, and it's going to show me all the windows that have been modified in some form. So if I go down to Purchasing and Expand Purchasing, and I know that it was the vendor window here, and I expand it, what I, oops, not that one, the vendor maintenance window, excuse me. It, it has one option, and that is Microsoft Dynamics GP, and that radio button is not selected. That's the problem. We need to make sure that for all of these options, at least one of these options is selected. You're going to see different, uh, especially in Windows, you're going to see Dynamics GP, you're going to see Smart List. If you see Smart List, you want to make sure that that's selected because that is using Smart List for the lookups for those particular windows. In this case, because there was only one option and it was not selected, I was getting the error. So if we save this now, and then we go back to the um, uh, vendor window, we should have cleared that error. Lo and behold, we did. 
Another spot that could be an issue is if you are not loading the correct dictionary. So that is being done through your dynamics.set file. So I'm opening up my set file here, and this is, let's say it's a report that's problematic. See how it's pointing to the C drive? This is the default when you do a fresh install of GP from scratch. And so this typically needs to be pointed to the modified forms and reports dictionary uh, folder that we have up on the server. So most often you'll see something like this, and you'll see GP server name, whatever that is, slash GP share. And this is just, again, a, a nomenclature that we typically suggest, slash data, and then that would be it. So wherever your modified reports dictionary is for the firm, you will need to point to it here at this level in order for that person to have access to that particular report. So if, if the modified forms and, and reports ID is pointing to a modified form, but you haven't loaded up that dictionary for that report, it's going to give that error. So this is the poor you would go to make sure that you're getting the right error or the right message and the right reports uh, distributed to your users. Tiffany, let's jump into how to reprint a check. Awesome. Can you all hear me? You're, you're somewhat muffled at this point. Did you change headsets or something? She must be changing her headset. There you go. Is that better? That's it. That's better. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, David, for your walkthroughs. So now we're going to go into how to reprint checks. Now, there are many reasons why you may want to reprint checks. Um, one could be, you know, possibly you went to the wrong printer. Um, you know, you printed um, on your paper double-sided or on your check stock double-sided. Um, we just recently actually ran into that issue. Um, and so you may want to go in and reprint your checks. Now, there are multiple different occasions. One could be where you've printed checks, but you have not clicked the process button, which is normally through your post checks window, this process button. After you've printed checks, you click process. When you do that, you have to go through another process of voiding out those payments, recreating the check batch, and then reprinting. But I'm going to show you where you would go to reprint checks for the same check number. So say you printed on the wrong printer, but you have pre-printed check stock, and so you need to use the same number over again. So what you want to do is you want to go into your checkbook maintenance, and you want to make sure that you select this duplicate check numbers box. Once you do that, you're then able to reprint the same check number on your checks again. So then that way, um, instead of you having to go in and, and um, you know, throw away those that check stock that you had, you won't have to do that because now all you have to do is just go in to that post checks window, which is again here under transactions, under purchasing. You select your check batch that you had printed pri prior, and then you can click on reprint checks. Now you want to keep track of this starting check number because you want to make sure that you're reprinting on the right um, number. But here, this gives you a little, a little help because it'll show you which checks are out there for that particular batch that you can reprint. So you're able to do um, your range straight from there. So now we're going to go through how and when to void. Now, there are many different options for voiding. Um, you can void in um, your your purchasing module, um, and when you void your open transactions, what you will do is you will void transactions that are only open and completely unapplied transactions. You cannot void a partially applied document within this window because it's literally opening or voiding open payables transactions. What you would do is you would go into Void Open Payables Transactions, and you would select this button right here, and it will void out that transaction for you. 
you can also void your historical transactions. And your historical transactions, that would be when you have completely, fully applied documents there. So your, your historical transactions are documents that are fully and completely applied. In sales, you also have that, that option. But this time, it looks a little different. If you notice here, you won't see anything that says void over here on this side of the window. What you'll have to do is go into Post-it Transactions, because in sales, the only documents that can be voided are the documents that are in the open table. Now, documents that are fully applied can still remain in the open table. But once pay, the paid transactions removal routine is run, then the documents are moved to history, and they cannot be voided any longer. So you would go here. You would pick a, uh, a, a customer. You would pick a document. And then you would select your, put your void date in, your posting date, and then you would select void in order to void that transaction. Now we're going to go through printing and reading a batch edit list. Now, whenever you have a batch out there, we recommend that you always print a batch edit list. And now the reason why we suggest that is because there are times when you have multiple transactions in your batch, and you may run into a posting issue, or you may run into an issue where all of the transactions didn't post through, but you'll see that you still have the remaining transactions number here and the batch total, which will still look the same. Oftentimes, it's because some of those documents posted through and some did not. So we always recommend that you go into your batch edit list, even if it's only to look at your distributions and to verify and make sure that all of your transactions are actually posting how you intend them to be. So on here, we're going to look at this batch edit list. We're looking through. We're seeing we're not seeing any error messages. But then when we scroll down here, we see that we have a distribution error. And what this is telling us is that our distributions are not set up correctly, and so this transaction will not be posted. So what we want to do is we want to go in, go into that transaction, and we know that it was demo 3. We click on distributions. And generally, you're able to ch check this default box and it will allow you to set up your distributions here based on whatever you have your default posting account set up to be. And then you can say OK. You can say Save. And now, when we go back into that batch and print that batch edit list, we should no longer see that distribution error message. And we do not. So we know that this batch is now OK to post all the way through. Now, how to unmark a batch. There may be times when you go into a batch and you'll see this error message pop up. This batch has been marked for posting by another user. Sometimes this happens because a user may have selected to post a batch, but then somehow you know, they logged out of their system or they just did not complete that process. How you can unmark that batch is by going to the Administration tab selecting your routines, and here under Master Posting. Now when we select Master Posting, you can display all batches for all series, or you can limit that. And then you also can limit it based on your marked batches. Now the batch that we saw before was the DM batch, and it said it was marked by another user. If we simply uncheck that, that now makes that batch available to post. Now we're going to go through correcting journal entries. Now the journal entries that can be corrected are your standard, your quick journal, your reversing, or your clearing journal entries. What cannot be backed out are voided entries, your year-end closing entries that happen when you run your year-end um, process, those types of um, transactions cannot be um, corrected. How you get to that window is 
from your financial series under transactions, you can open up general and you click you select this correct button here. Now there are two options here. One is back out a journal entry. And what happens there is it will create one entry and this will create a reversal of your original transaction. Your second option here is to back out a journal entry and create a correcting entry. Now what that is helpful for is if you have multiple lines in your transaction and you want to just change maybe one of those accounts or you wanted to change the date for that, for that transaction and you would select this option because what will happen is it will create a reversal of that original that original journal entry, but then upon saving or posting the reversal, a complete copy of that original entry will then be created and it will show in your original window. Now you can void for your open year and your most recent historical year. And you would select the journal entry, it'll have them all listed here, the ones that are available for you to do. And then you would select one and you would then go through and create that correcting journal entry. Lastly, we're going to speak on how to unapply a payment. Now, why would a customer, why would you want to unapply a payment? It may be because the customer has a payment or a credit memo or a return that was applied to the incorrect invoice. Um, it could be because a customer has a payment or a credit memo or a return that was applied to the correct invoice but wasn't applied correctly. Um, so what you want to do is you'll go into sales under trans and apply sales document. Now you'll select a customer ID and for this we're going to select Aaron Fitz Electrical and then in here we're going to pick a document and I'm going to go ahead and pick this return and here we'll see all of these transactions here. Now this, this document hasn't been applied to anything so I'm able to go in here now and select which transactions I would like to apply it to. It shows me my original amount and my unapplied amount. And so if I say OK, and I say I'll go back into that window because I say, oh, whoops, I did that wrong. So I'll go in, I'll select that, I'll select that same return, and now I'm able to uncheck and unapply that. It could happen because of this apply date or possibly because of this apply posting date that you may want to change that. Thank you all. Megan, back to you. Thank you, Tiffany, and thank you, David, for yours as well earlier. I do know that we did get a few questions in, but as we are running up right against our time here, um, I, it looks like those questions might take a little bit longer to answer than the, the amount of time that we have left. So what we're going to do is I'm, uh, we'll pass those questions back over to David and Tiffany, and they will follow up offline after the webinar to make sure that those of you who did ask a question get the answers that you need. If anyone has any additional questions after today's webinar, of course, you are always welcome to contact the Armenino Help Desk. Uh, the information is up on the screen here for the Armenino Help Desk as well as David and Tiffany. As I mentioned earlier, we are going to be sending out uh, the on-demand recording of the webinar as well as the slides, so no need to hurry up and copy those down. I know that some of you already have the Help Desk in your contact lists already. I know a lot of familiar faces, as David mentioned, on the audience list today. So if you do have any additional questions, feel free to follow up afterwards. As you exit today's webinar, there is a quick survey, so definitely please take a moment to let us know your thoughts on today's webinar. And uh, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Tiffany and David, for your great insights today.